Hey film fans, you're watching Craig's Film Reviews. I'm Craig, and this week we're going to be looking at Skyscraper, the new action adventure starring Dwayne Johnson, aka The Rock. Skyscraper is an action adventure starring Dwayne Johnson and Nev Campbell. A former soldier and FBI agent turned safety expert, Will Sawyer, is hired to carry out a safety inspection of billionaire Zhao's new building, a high tech 200 story skyscraper. Zhao lets Zoya and his family stay in one of the apartment suites, but when a gang of criminals who are targeting Zhao attack and set fire to the building, Sawyer, who has lost a leg in an explosion when he was an FBI agent, must rescue his wife and two kids from both the burning building and the psychotic villains. Skyscraper is an obvious homage to Die Hard, the 1988 action classic starring Bruce Willis as a cop trapped in a building fighting off master criminals. Now Die Hard was highly influential and since then we've had dozens of similar action movies. We've had Die Hard on a boat, we've had Die Hard on a plane, we've had Die Hard on a bus, We've even had Die Hard in an ice cream van. And now we have Skyscraper, which is uh, Die Hard in a building. So let's start by comparing the characters of the, of the heroes in Die Hard and Skyscraper. So Skyscraper, our hero is called Will Sawyer. So don't worry if you forget his name because he's basically The Rock. Uh, he's, the Rock is essentially playing himself. He's given one interesting action to it, we'll get to in a minute, but for the most part, he's just a fairly, he's just a nice guy. He loves his family, his business is on the grow, uh, he's completely adjusted to something that's happened to his life. So what's happened to him, and what kind of could be an interesting character trait for uh, an action hero, we've not really seen much before, is that he was in an explosion when he was an FBI agent and he's lost his leg and now uses a prosthetic limb. Uh, and unfortunately it doesn't really impact much on the plot or the character surely the most interesting thing would have been to do is to allow him to adjust to the injury on screen so the way they, they play it in the movie is that the rock sorry will sawyer um has the accident at the beginning of the first scene and then we cut 10 years later and he's now happily married to his surgeon uh, played by neve campbell and two children he's got two children and he's now a safety expert. He has got this prosthetic limb, but as he talks to a few of the other characters, he's completely adjusted to life. He's realized it was a blessing. He would have never met his wife and had children. Um, he's not been inhibited by it in any way, and it's not really affected him too much. And I can understand why they do this. Now, obviously, we want to sh they, the filmmakers and The Rock, they want to show that if someone has a disability or a prosthetic limb, then they're not inhibited in any way and that they can have the same kind of life as everyone else and it can even in some ways enrich their lives. A very admirable trait, another admirable uh, theme for a film to have, but it doesn't make it dramatically interesting and we've got no real reason to root for Will Sawyer other than that he's a nice guy and he cares about his family. Of course we can relate to the idea that he wants to, he loves his family wants to rescue them from the burning building, anyone would. But why are we following this guy? What makes him special? What does he need to learn? How does he change over the course of the story? And in this one, he doesn't really. He doesn't change at all. He starts off as a nice guy and he ends as a nice guy. Well, obviously, we don't want to have a character who's an arsehole at the beginning and turns completely nice at the end. That's, that's not exactly the same as having a character arc. But he needs to have a few flaws uh, just to create a bit of drama and to have him something to overcome as well. Surely, the idea should have been that it's a more recent thing that he's lost his limb and he's adjusting to that still. He might not be in depression or wanting to, still wanting to get on with his life, um, but perhaps he's lost some confidence. Perhaps he's not sure about his physical abilities anymore. Um, perhaps he tries to hide his disability from other people. And perhaps the storyline could have been when this situation happens and he ha has to rescue his family, he overcomes that that fear or that, that lack of confidence and begins to accept that's a part of who he is now and that he's realised that his life has been made better by his by what's happened to him. Um, or he's completely adjusted to it, maybe not made better but completely adjusted to it. Um, so they don't really give him too much to do in this one. In comparison with John McClane, who is a, such a human hero, that was one of the best things about Die Hard was that in the 80s, we'd had a decade of people like Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sylvester Stallone, um, these muscle-bound action lunks that were mowing down waves and waves of villains without too much, without even breaking a sweat. 
we finally had a human hero in, in John McClane played by Bruce Willis he gets scared he cries he gets beaten and bloodied he's hurt physically vulnerable emotionally vulnerable um, we can project onto him as the everyman um, when the the uh, like the action scenes are happening we're totally on board with him he has a nice streak of self-deprecating humour um, he's just a very rootable character and he has to learn at the beginning of the film at the beginning of Die Hard him and his wife are separated because his wife has chosen to have a career in LA and he's a cop in New York so the idea is that he's been too stubborn and selfish to to come help her with her career and as the film goes on he really he risks his life to save her realises how much he loves her realise what an idiot he's been um, what mistakes he's made with it by nearly losing his marriage over it so he actually learns as and grows as the movie goes on and Will Sawyer doesn't doesn't need to do this he's, he's a fine he's a nice guy already he's got it all figured out there's no there's no drama there's no tension between him and his wife there's no money worries really they kind of mention a little bit and that his business is still coming up but he's doing all right for himself and uh, there doesn't seem to be any other dramatic tension there um, aside from the the main drama of the the building on fire and risking his family. One of the ways the skyscraper definitely is worse than Die Hard is in terms of villains. Once again, we've got Eastern European thugs. We've seen it so many times before in John Wick, The Equalizer. You know what I'm talking about, these kind of bald-headed, hard-nut guys. Kind of a physical threat to the hero, but they're, they're not nothing special at all. Um, compared to the villains in Die Hard, Every get villain, they're not forget faceless thugs. We know all of their attributes. You've got Alexander Goodenough with bleached blonde hair, uh, a physical threat to to Bruce Willis, and also we have the uh, Alan Rickman, who's one of the best villains ever, as Hans Gruber, a witty, urbane, intellectual guy. He has a completely different energy to Bruce Willis. He's got that kind of rough-hewn, uh, all-American, everyman appeal, whereas Hans Gruber is this kind of slightly effete. Uh, our Bane, like we said before, uh, villain, and uh, there's none of that in this film. There, there's no tensions really between the villain. There's no way that they're gonna, there's they're gonna win. There's no way that they're ever on top too much compared to the, to Will Sawyer. Uh, very much disappointing in terms of the villains on that one. I've I've got a theory about this. Bear with me. I think the problem with The Rock. Um, or sorry, Jane Dwayne Johnson now, he's a serious actor. The problem with that is he's in control of most of his movies. He's a producer and he's in creative control of most of his own films. But unlike, say, someone like Tom Cruise, who works with uh, good directors and kind of challenges himself a lot of the times with the films that he makes, Dwayne Johnson doesn't really challenge himself in any way. He hires the same kind of directors. We'll get on to the director of this one in a moment, but and why I think he was miscast. But he doesn't challenge himself in terms of the characters that he plays and the films that he makes and the directors that he picks they're all kind of very bland and safe movies they cut, they match up to the rock brand so in this one the brand is the nice guy family man who overcomes adversity he's physically invulnerable i mean the, the difference between this uh will sawyer and say john john mcclain is that this guy's superhuman there's one scene where he climbs up a his kids are trapped on top of a build, burning building and unlike any most other reasonable action heroes they would try to get help from everyone else around them or even there's no there's no question that the fire brigade can help him anyway or any of the authorities can help him anyway he jumps on a motorbike climbs up a crane a hundred stories high and there's a little moments where he's like oh I'm nearly going to fall off but he barely breaks a, breaks a sweat and gets to the top with ease this guy is not and every man, he's a superhero. Uh, and that's the kind of image that The Rock wants to portray for himself. Now, he, I don't think he's a particularly good actor. He's not a bad actor, but he, he's an actor of limited ability, let's say, limited range. And I do think that if he just pushed himself a little bit more, who knows what he could do? He could be like Channing Tatum. Channing Tatum is a, has the same kind of idea. He he got he's got that kind of had that reputation of just being like a meathead, like a lunk. And so what he did with Twenty One Jump Street films, he really kind of leaned into that and really mocked his own persona as this meathead. And then he did something like Foxcatcher, 
which took it to somewhere darker and more tragic. Um, and if only The Rock would kind of push himself a little bit like that, who knows what these films could have been. So I think that's part of the problem. And also, in terms of the villains, and why there's not much of eye-catching support, is because he doesn't want to share the screen. Maybe he doesn't want uh, a, a charismatic villain stealing his thunder, or a funny comic relief character stealing the film from him. I don't know. I'm not The Rock, but maybe that's what's holding it back a little bit. One way the film definitely is an improvement on Die Hard, so I will say this, uh, that Neve Campbell, it's great to see her back on the screen again. She was, you forget how good she was in Scream and a lot of films she did in the 90s, like Wild Things, you forget that she was a great actress and could have gone quite far. And uh, it's nice to see her back on the screen again. She plays his wife, uh, Will Sawyer's wife, Sarah, who isn't, is a former army surgeon. So, unlike Bonnie Bedelia's character, Holly, in Die Hard, who's just kind of a damsel distress waiting for John McClane to come and rescue her, Sarah is able to kick butt and handle high pressure situations. So she does just as much saving the kids and getting them out and thinking quickly as Will does. Um, which is one plus, I will give that one plus uh, point to Skyscraper over Die Hard. And actually, if you're going to do a new Die Hard in a something film, Die Hard in a bouncy castle, no, don't forget that one. Uh, Die Hard in a, oh, who knows, Die Hard in a vet school. Um, you could have a female hero, perhaps a female action hero to play that one. That could be, uh, that could be a way to do uh, reinvigorate the genre. Okay, let's talk about the director. So the director this time is kind of a surprise choice. It's Rawson Marshall Thurber. Bit of a mouthful, but he uh, he's more known as a comedy director, almost completely as a comedy director. He first became famous a few years ago when he directed um, the Budweiser commercials. You know the ones. What's up? He directed those, and that kind of launched his Hollywood career as a comedy director for films like Dodgeball and We're the Millers and then he made uh, Central Intelligence with The Rock and so I keep on The Rock but for me he's The Rock but he's okay Dwayne Johnson and Kevin Hart so an action buddy comedy so some action scenes in it but mainly a comedy film uh, but obviously now he wants to branch out into the more action genre so fair play to him he wants to, to wants to develop his skills as a filmmaker move into a kind of different genre and he doesn't do a bad job, but he just does a bland job, unfortunately. He doesn't have the natural feel for suspense or a visual style of his own. Uh, so the film comes off as kind of pedestrian, a lot of flat lighting and bland setups. Um, also, he doesn't... He, unfortunately, the problem with a lot of modern movies is that, so let's go and we'll talk about this a little bit, is that a lot of filmmakers, a lot of modern films, the action sequences aren't really directed by the director themselves. They're directed by the second unit director. So what's a second unit? A second unit director is usually someone who's a proficient with stunt work and um, special effects and explosions and that kind of thing. And they are in, they direct the action sequences. The director will give suggestions and they'll give uh, storyboards and pre-visualization and and will finesse the final action sequences but but for the most part the action sequences are directed by the second unit team and stunt coordinators so they go off and do their thing and they make the action sequences and the director will stay on set with the main stars of the film and direct most of the drama sequences and all the other kind of actor sequences as well and then when they come together they kind of edit it all together and make sure and reshoot bits they want to and kind of make sure it all flows together so obviously the understandable reason that is cheaper to do that and also it's much safer to do that if you've got someone who is uh, proficient in stunt work and action sequences explosions they know how to shoot it correctly to make it look exciting they know how to do it in a way that's safe and no one's going to get hurt so um, it makes sense to do that uh, but the only problem with that is sometimes they use the same kind of people they use stuntmen and they can't really hide that the actors aren't there. So they use a lot of long lenses and quick cutting. Um, and the, there's no kind of continuity in terms of style between the, the actual film itself and the action. And I think that's kind of what happens in the skyscraper as well. The, um, not to say that the directing in the normal scenes is any great shapes. It's pretty bland, usual traditional classic editing style, not much... Uh, 
I wouldn't say there's many great visual ideas, except one, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, and I don't think Thurber and his action directors really have m much of a feel of suspense. Uh, it doesn't know how to build a scene. Most of the scenes happen very quickly, like the scene where uh, the rock's got to go. There's like a turbine. He's got to run through it for some bizarre plot reason. Um, and uh, it, it's not built. There's no tension to build up. There's no near death escapes. Really, it's all kind of over with. Not much build up to it at all. It's not a very suspenseful scene when it really could be. It's all done a bit too easy. Um, compare that to Die Hard. John McTiernan's a great director, really comes from that Hitchcockian style, uh, a real visual stylist. If you look at the Die Hard cinematography by Jan, Jan de Bont, who went on to make films like Speed himself as a director, but he was the a he became the A-list cinematographer after that. Um, he used anamorphic lens, uh, widescreen, uh, lots of lens flare. If you think J.J. Abrams uses a lot of lens flare, check out Die Hard. Um, but it looks so dramatic and cinematic and it looks absolutely great and a lot of now um skyscraper just looks kind of bland digitized the action sequences and all the stunt work are obviously kind of cgi and fake and there's no real sense of any weight or any kind of uh real physical danger for any of the characters again that ties into the fact that that will saw is pretty invulnerable and pretty much a superhero there doesn't seem to be any real danger to anyone in this one the violence obviously is uh PG-13, 12A rating, so no one really gets hurt that badly. When they die, they kind of die off screen with a little bit of, oh, when they get shot, but there's no real blood or anything like that. So there's no, there's no, uh, what's the word? There's no tactileness to it. There's no, there's no sense of danger. Um, and it just, again, just adds up to a bland, bland movie. When I found out that Thurber was writing and directing this film, I thought, okay, maybe we could ever, maybe it's going to be lean towards more comedy. Maybe it would be a, almost like a self-parody, almost like a spoof of an action film, like make this die hard in a building and really lean into it. That might have been more fun than the kind of bland, forgettable movie that we got. Perhaps, who knows, maybe that's what the original intention was, and a lot of those the more interesting ideas got cut out. It's only 100 minutes long. It's more than possible that there's a longer version out there where all the interesting stuff, like the character development and some of the humour, was completely cut out. The one half-decent idea that Thurber has, although it's a pretty unoriginal one, is the Hall of Mirrors scene at the end, but this time it's got high-tech video screens instead of mirrors. Uh, it's a nice little touch and it gives a few nice effective moments in the final sequence, but it's been done a million times before in films like Enter the Dragon, Lady from Shanghai, and The Shadow. And that unfortunately doesn't add much new to it. And the way it's set up is pretty lame. The billionaire character introduces the uh, hero character, Will Sawyer, to his room of Paul of Hall of Mirrors and says, oh, look at my Hall of Mirrors. But he doesn't actually give a reason why he would make a room full of Hall of Mirrors apart from having a cool action scene. He might as well have said, hey, look at my Hall of Mirrors. Wouldn't that make an interesting scenario for an action sequence? Overall, Skyscraper is a very pale imitation of Die Hard, taking the central hook of that movie, but missing that film's sense of humour, feel for character and story development, acting talent and visual style. What is left is a very bland, uninvolving cartoon that is so dull it lacks a so bad it's good entertainment factor. It's not objectively terrible, the filmmaking is competent and Dwayne Johnson is still a watchable and charismatic actor, but with just a little more effort, a little more known humour and a little more emotional development, it could have been half as good as Die Hard. So thanks for watching the video on Skyscraper, um, just to reiterate, it's not a terrible film, if you want to go and see it, it's fine, it kills an hour and a half, it's very short. Um, there'll be it's, it's a few laughs in it, um, but it's just such an instantly forgettable film. As soon as you walk out of the cinema, you forget. And I think by doing this video, I don't tend to like to do negative film reviews because what's the point in that? I'd rather do films that I actually enjoy. But in this kind of case, I felt that there would be some value in comparing it to a similar film of the genre, so Die Hard. A great action movie compared to Skyscraper, which by any stretch of imagination is not a great movie. Um, and I suppose there is some value in that, comparing two films together and hopefully we've learnt something. Uh, so it's not an, uh, just a trash, this one, it's not just a trash the film. And, and as to paraphrase John Goodman in Raising Arizona, I'd rather light a candle than curse your darkness. So thanks for watching the show. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. If you've got any comments, any thoughts or feelings about Skyscraper, if you totally disagree with me, uh, hit, uh, write some comments below. Uh, hit like if you like the video and subscribe if you want to see more of this kind of thing. I've done a few now 
uh, starting to get the swing of it, I hope. And uh, if you also you want to see uh, a few more different videos from me, we've got uh, the podcast, Screaming Into the Void, with my co colleagues Harry and Bruce, where we talk all manner of things and films, but mainly we seem to circle back to Star Wars. So, um, thanks very much for watching, guys.